So it's my pleasure to open the very last lecture of our summer school this year. And again, we have uh, John uh, with us. And since it was Helena who introduced John last time, uh, I will use this privilege uh, to stress some, uh, some information about John, which I will be happy to share with you once again. So sorry for overlapping because I missed the previous lecture. So John is a very special person, both for HEC and our summer school. He is probably one of the very first international professors who became a real part of HEC many years ago. I already lost track how many years was that. But I do remember that John's first appearance at the summer school was in 2009, so more than 10 years ago. And at that time, he was only international speaker for the whole, uh, I would say, Moscow region at that time. So you can imagine how brave John was to be just in the middle of 50 people, most of whom don't speak any English, but he survived. And summer school also survived as well. And it was that successfully that starting from the next year, we switched completely into English. So it's just very good demonstration of the fact that just one person can change the whole story. And we're really happy and grateful for John about that. So every time John is with us, it's some kind of uh, magic uh, and fun. And John teach us that uh, research is always about fun and opening new horizons. So that's why it's my pleasure to give our screen to John today. So I'm sure that you're gonna have many questions. So please put them in chat. If some questions are just clarification question, I will stop John and ask him to comment. Otherwise he will read your questions once he finished and he'll respond to each of that. So John, again, thanks for joining us today. And the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. I'll also say I, I acknowledge gratefully the support of HSC throughout this time. I believe I've been officially um, an international fellow and uh, sort of advisor for HSC since 2010. I think this, or and maybe 2011 was the beginning of the contract, but I also served as an advisor on the advisory board, I think, to the economics department in 2010. So it's been over a decade now that I have been officially working with um, HSC, and it's been a great pleasure. And I miss this year's um, travel to Moscow, summer being the best time to visit Moscow, unless it's covered in 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 smoke and ash otherwise it's 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 one it's wonderful and uh i hope all of you are doing well uh depending upon where you are in the world good evening good night good day to every good evening or good day to everybody so today i'm going to talk about a paper let me share the let me share the screen first okay this uh paper is co-written with you how you and and me and I am literally the third author here. Most of the work and the ideas came from my two Chinese colleagues, Yu Hao and Yuan Zhili. And um, mostly what I've done is help shape the final document and make suggestions guiding the direction and uh, uh, format of the, of the paper. We went back and forth on some of the ideas several times, but um, this is primarily their paper. So I'm very happy to share and advertise this great work by them. Now, um, one of the things I should emphasize is that I will focus on the paper, but because this paper is partly about certain other issues like technology too, I will take advantage of this talk to make little digressions into economic history as well, which might be useful and helpful for the audience, who especially was not familiar with either the history of technology or with Chinese history. So let's get started. And as Maria said, if you have clarificatory questions, please put them in chat. I won't have time to be looking at them, but Maria can flag them and uh, stop me so that I can answer them. Otherwise, main questions should be reserved for the end. Usually, I don't take too long. As Masha will tell you, I'm reasonably good. Uh, one, of, one of the few one of the few advantages I have is that I tend to finish on time, 
or I can make myself finish on time. So there's always time for questions. I'm not known for eating up the question time of my seminars. So don't worry, I'll get to you in the end. Okay, so let's look at this paper. If we look at this, uh, we'll go back here. How do, the, the, you know, the main question in this paper is very straightforward, which is how do improvements in information transmission affect market integration? And the, the hypothesis or the question we want to ask is very simple. What was the impact of the telegraph construction and grain market integration in late imperial China? Now, behind this very narrow question and very specific question, there is one big, deep, profound issue, which is how does technology change the structure of the economy? And the simple question is directed to the standard things economists try to look at, which is the extent to which new technologies can improve the world. But we, to understand this fully, we need to understand something about the background. Because if it were that simple, we would expect new technologies would be rapidly adopted all over the world. But in fact, that's simply not true. Partly because new technologies, which is, is not going to be mentioned in this paper, undermine many of the existing social arrangements. And very often, resistance to technology is one of the most important issues that faces societies which are choosing to open up. And they're not always crazy to be wary of this because there are a lot, have been a lot of times in history when new technology has led to the downfall of a regime. So the obvious answer that you should always let technology in is not clear cut, as we see today in our debates about things like social media. But this was especially the case for China, which had been especially leery of foreigners. Bear in mind that China in the Qing dynasty, that is the last imperial dynasty of China, was not formally ruled by the Han Chinese. The Qing dynasty was a result of the Manchu conquest, which was actually a coalition of the Manchus in the north and the remnants of the Mongols and various other tribes. Those who may not know Chinese history will know the last purely aristocratic based Chinese dynasty was the Song dynasty. The Song dynasty in the 12th century or 11th, 12th century was the peak of world technology up to that time. That is the Song dynasty reached the highest levels of technology and per capita income of any country in the world up to about the 10th or 11th century. And then they were invaded and destroyed and taken over by the Mongols over a century period. And the grandson of Genghis Khan, Kubla Khan, finally took China and started the Yuan dynasty, which was entirely ruled by the Mongols. The Ming dynasty came to power by driving out the Mongols, but they spent the entirety of the Ming dynasty fighting the Mongols to the north of China. At the end of the Ming Dynasty, the Ming Dynasty was brought down by a coalition of new groups from the north, or what the Chinese called barbarians, who took over China. So that in that world, it's not surprising that the hold of the Manchus on the Chinese empire was particularly tenuous. And they were worried both about their maintenance. For example, the Manchus often spoke their local dialect among themselves while maintaining Mandarin Chinese as the official language of the country as a whole. So you can sort of see they were very much averse to foreigners. And one of the reasons China fell behind the rest of the world, especially in the 19th century, was that China was slow to adopt a variety of technologies, including the railroad. So the railroad, the telegraph, and many other technologies were delayed. There's a very good paper by Debin Ma of the London School uh, talk, from LSE talking about the fact that the, Jap the Chinese dominated and monopolized the silk trade, but the reluctance to mechanize silk allowed the Japanese to catch up and overtake the Chinese in less than 50 years. And part of this is related to the problem of the telegraph. 
So now let's continue. Information, as we know, is critical for the efficient functioning market. As the law of one price presupposes efficient information flow. But as we know, this is not always true. This is rarely true, in fact. Even in developed economies, information isn't perfect. And that's why every advanced information has some small or large effects on the efficiency of markets. And when the more difficult it is for agents to obtain accurate information in time, the harder it is to get actual transactions. I remember when I was an uh, undergraduate at Caltech, Charlie Pratt would run these early experiments in which they did the famous double oral auction experiment, which are basically bit the simple supply and demand experiment. But we did one version, I remember, where we were, the traders were sitting in different rooms and somebody brought a newspaper to us with the prices and we bid and there was an actual time delay where we made bids and we got offers by a newspaper that circulated over the various rooms in the building to try to see what the effects were of information delay into getting these things. So this is a relevant issue. We want to think about this. So what's the historical background? Contrary to what you might suspect, Imperial China was actually quite market integrated by the standards of the world, especially by the standards of Europe. Why? Because there was a prosperous long distance trade along major waterways, right? The early Chinese civilization was built around the two great rivers, which were both the source of water and the source of information, communication, transportation. And this high level of communication near the major waterways allowed for a great deal of market integration. The work of Xu and Keller in 2070, the AER, shows that they're actually quite similar to Europe. For example, if we just look quickly at these two pictures, on the, 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 the red shows you the comparison to, with, with England, and the, the blue picture shows you the comparison with France. And basically, what those are is differences in, in, in sort of the effect of prices uh, as the, the decline in prices from the city, basically as you move away from a particular area. And the degree of market integration in China was actually quite similar in the 1700s to both France and Britain. So in both cases, um, China was not doing very badly in terms of market integration. A lot of the huge gap between China and Europe explodes, it's all in the 19th century. One of the puzzles is that, of course, there's a debate about how close China was to Europe on other margins. Some people like, for example, the so-called California School claims that China was in fact comparable to Europeans on most economic margins. In contrast, mainstream economic history tends to view China by the 18th century as somewhat behind the West on not just per capita income, but many other margins. Nonetheless, whichever story you believe, the big explosion that really cut them differently was the 19th century and in the Industrial Revolution. And indeed, it's part of what led to the opening up of the, West, of the East in general. That is the incursion by Europeans in both China and uh, Japan are part of the shock that forced to these two great um, Eastern empires to have to worry about the problem of dealing with Europeans. China tried to close itself off more. Japan decided to open up dramatically. All right, so let's think about this. Traditional information transmission depends mostly on letters carried by people, mostly along waterways, but there's also some land transportation, such as the United States, there's the famous Pony Express. But both of those are slow, they're unstable, and they're limited in scope, right? Uh, land transportation is limited by terrain, but it's also limited by weather. The river is even more limited by weather because depending upon weather conditions, it can get easier, harder, or impossible to travel. So if you think about that, that part of why the telegraph invention is so important is because of this. When I talk to students today, especially non-economists, my, my son says this because I've already indoctrinated him on this. And when he talks to his friends, my son works in high tech. Most people think, most young people think the last 30 years have had the most amazing inventions. But in fact, the last 30 to 50 years are nothing compared to the inventions that grew up between say the mid to late, say between 1870 and 1970. Any 30 year period of that century 
is more innovative than the last 30 years. If you doubt me, just think about, just think about the period between the 1930s and 1970. So around the period from the beginning of World War, or just before World War II, to, the, to, to 1969 or 1970. And think of the, what you get in those periods. We get commercial television, we get jets, we get long distance plane travel, we get various vaccines, polio, right? We get the polio vaccines. We get all the other vaccines that were developed during this time period. We develop high quality surgery. We get antibiotics. We get, uh, we get the proliferation of television. We get magnetic tape, the long playing player, the cassette player. All these things are coming out during this period. Compared to that, the inventions of the last 40 or 50 years, both measured by productivity changes and by just qualitative estimates of their impact totally ignores, totally says that all research says the innovations of the last 40 years are really pretty low level compared to the innovations of previous decades. And this is in a world with multiple countries having the potential for innovation. This is a world in which Japan, China, the Far East, and many second formerly poor countries, are not, Korea, are developing innovations at the very, trying their best to develop them at a rapid rate. Yet the sum total world innovation is nothing like what we saw at the end of the 19th century, early 20th. The 19th century, we get electricity, we get the, we get the light bulb, we get the telegraph, we get the telephone, we get the phonograph, right? As well as major improvements, iron and steel, combustible engines, the automobile, all these are dramatic, even the bicycle. These are dramatic changes in the world. So the telegraph is among the most famous. The electromagnetic telegraph was invented in 1836. Long distance telegram in, using Morse code was invented in 1844. By 1860, Britain, the European continent and the USA had established telegraph networks. That's very important, think about it. The machine was only invented in 1836. And it's not till 1844 that they come up with a good way of using the telegraph to convey information. That is once all people learn Morse code, then it's possible to just by using dots and dashes, that's longer and shorter beeps. When I was a boy, people tended to learn Morse code. I've forgotten already. But it was a very common thing when I was a young boy for boys Say at least I went to all boys school to learn Morse code and then to tap impolite messages to each other using our desks using Morse Morse code. That was a common thing boys used to do in the old days. Even I'm I've forgotten my Morse code already. And yet think that less than 20 years after the Morse code, Europe and the USA already had extensive networks. Since the West became involved in China, they had a strong interest in using Morse code and the telegraph because it would improve communications. Ministers of Western countries repeatedly petitioned the Qing dynasty to allow them to construct telegraph lines in China, but they were rejected. To tell you how different this is in attitude, consider the fact that in Russia, after especially the Crimean War, the Russians understood the technology would, was what was creating a gap between the militaries of Western Europe and Russia. So Russia rushed to embrace in the late 19th century, the Russia rushed to embrace the railroad. The railroad was so popular that is in the, for Russia in the late 19th century that the government tried to encourage foreigners to invest in Russia, sorry, uh, to invest in Russia by, making the bondholders guaranteed. So that among the many things the Russians did was to make it in the event of a bankruptcy, foreign bondholders would often be paid ahead of Russian bondholders. That there was a priority given. This is why bonds were considered among the safest things. Russian bonds were considered very safe, so much so that even after the Bolshevik revolution, foreign bondholders thought that, that they would still be compensated for this. It got to the point where in the 90s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Russian bonds from imperial days were actually selling for a few cents per American dollar because many foreigners believed 
that the Russia, the new Russian government would want to reestablish the capital markets by partially paying off longtime bondholders of, of, of Imperial Russia. Of course, this didn't happen, but it tells you something about the long historical feeling of the importance of Russian of credibility of the old Imperial regime. However, this rejection didn't continue. Why? Because you had more and more foreign invasion into China's coastal and frontier areas. Moreover, the various wars of the 19th century made it more likely that the imperial powers would interfere. Finally, the Chinese themselves began to urge the government to build telegraphs. So in 1881, notice this is now 40 years after Morse code, under the organization of Li Hongzhang, the first main telegraph line was complete, completed connecting Tianjin and Shanghai. Shanghai, of course, was one of the major treaty ports and one of the centers of commerce in the new China. But after that, the telegraph expanded very quickly. So in historical background, by 1911, there were 176 prefectures with telegraph offices in about two thirds of all of prefectures in China. So two thirds of the prefectures in China had telegraphs roughly 30 years after the initial uh, decision to, to build a telegraph, right? If we look at that, if we look at that today, all the, most of the telegraphs are developed. You see some out in the West, but a lot of it is actually not in Manchu, China, but it's in the very Eastern and Central areas of China that today are the centers of modern development in China. Right, many of the richest, most of the richest parts of China today are in these very dark areas. And you can also see how common it was by these areas and sort of say, if you look at it, the earliest ones were the dark ones and then the lighter, lighter ones were later, later establishment. For some of the others are either, so some of the ones here like these are unknown, but these are, the ones up here are unknown, but we have data on the others where they didn't have a telegraph at that time. Now, historical background. Although the, the, the telegraph was introduced for military purposes, of course, the telegram, the telegraph offered commercial telegram services. And it's not surprising that this was rapidly adopted. There were four types of telegrams, official telegrams from the government, telegraph office's own telegrams, where that's just they're communicating with themselves, what they called urgent telegrams and ordinary telegrams with different rates, okay? And it's these two sort of ordinary telegrams and urgent telegrams were what merchants mainly used. Uh, apparently, despite the fact that telegraph was not cheap, they were affordable for merchants. I guess you can think about uh, the cost of a telegraph as something like um, a long distance phone call would have been in the 1970s. I remember every time we got a long distance phone call in my house, everybody would start running around and sort of say, long distance, long distance, because it was quite expensive, right? It was equivalent, probably I would say for you to get it in Europe to get a sense of how expensive this is. It would be like, I imagine that long distance phone calls cost, say to the US cost three to five euros per call, per minute per minute rather, three to five euros per minute. If the call costs three euros per minute, I think you would take phone calls a little bit more seriously. So, and of course, think about it. Relative to almost every other information at the time, the telegraphic information arrives instantaneously between stations. And tele, you know, merchants use this because it was obvious. Here's some examples. So uh, I will read, I will just describe it to you. The idea is that, for example, um, Ningbo, which is near Shanghai, it's where my great grandfather was. My original, my family was originally from Ningbo before moving to Shanghai, uh, and that's where my my great grandfather was. My great grandfather's time, uh, Ningbo and Chuanzhou already had been very good at using the telegraph in the commodity trade. For example, we have evidence that uh, a shipping company sent five telegrams to Ningbo to contact ships which were on the rivers telling them to continue on to Jiaozhou for trade. So the, in other words, this is very important, right? They want to change what the ship is doing and rather than stop someplace, tell them to keep going down the line where the telegraph became a way to set, convey that information. They, in, in other ways, they tried to affect the market that way. If the market price fell rapidly, they used it for collusion. They tried to, uh, uh, this, they tried to send uh, information to merchants uh, 
to try to collude in such ways to manipulate the market. And as a result of all this kind of collusion, many things that were often done at the local level become national. So it's not only used to improve competition, it's also used to decrease competition in the sense that now it's possible to have, especially in a world like China, in which many merchant groups had quasi-collusive arrangements throughout the empire, they, will try, they were trying to maintain these collusive arrangements at the same time that these technologies were probably increasing competition in general. Furthermore, it becomes very useful for media because the media starts publishing market information. Um, they always part, they, they provide information about prices and about the stock markets, both at home and abroad. So for example, the Hong Kong tea industry made a rule that it should publish in both Chinese and foreign newspapers to make Chinese and foreign merchants aware of timely commercial information in the 1870s. Since there was a large group of foreign merchants in, in China at that time, and they were very powerful, as well as the Chinese merchants, they insisted that data about their industry were published and made widely available in both foreign newspapers and in, local, and in Chinese language newspapers. The empirical strategy is a simple one. It's a straight difference in difference. That is to sort of say what we're going to look at is the effect on price deviation of the existence of telegraphs. And we distinguish between cases in which we have one of the, what, what we're going to do is we're going to look at two prefectures. We're going to look at cases in which only one of the two have a telegraph versus cases in which both have telegrams and cases in which they have none. And we also look at situations in which there's the effect of the waterway. So we also control for the existence of being along a commercial waterway. All right, and we'll discuss some other kinds of tests we do later on, but those are the main thing. And then there are prefecture pair fixed effects and province pair fixed effects and year fixed effects. Okay, so this, is this clear to everyone? Are there any questions about the basic setup? So let's look at things first. First on data, the rice prefectures are taken at the prefecture monthly level. And these the data come from 114 prefectures in nine provinces in South China for 500 months from 1870 to 1911. And you see in gray, the sample prefectures, right? It's close to half of all China's geography, but it's probably 90% of the economically active areas of economic, that is my guess is that that's like 80 to 90%, maybe 80% of GDP of China by 1911 is coming from those areas. And certainly today, that's where all the GDP growth is occurring in those gray areas, right? With only an exception of some places in white that we do not have data for. Data on telegrams are taken from traffic history communications, which have been compiled in 1936. And data on geographic information are from the Atlas of Chinese History, edited by Tan Qixing, Qixiang, and the historical geographical information by the Harvard Yanjing Institute of Discovery China. So we've, we've gated data from all the major places that they're available. All right, so you can look this up later, but we have all and this may be useful to you if you want to do some more work on China. Um, okay, this is a case in which I didn't have time to make the graphs prettier because a lot of these we were wrangling about and we finished the graphs a couple of days ago, the tables. Uh, so it's quite limited, but um, what did I do? I at least tried to highlight the more important things. So what you're interested in is situations in which areas have a negative sign in the first order regression. So this tells you that when both had the telegram, the negative sign means there was a large effect in terms of lowering average grain prices between those two prefectures. As you can see, when only one had the telegraph, we have weaker and more ambiguous results. Right, depending upon what, what kinds of observations we use and how we use certain controls, we get slightly different, slightly, I'm not going to go into detail, but depending upon which, which specifications we use, we actually get both positive and negative uh, results. So it shows you how, 
how unstable, non-robust the, situ- the cases are with just one telegraph. It's another way of sort of saying that one telegraph is not obviously able to be used into the prefecture which doesn't have a telegraph. So there's no really clear cut effect on the price differences between those two prefectures. In contrast, when you have two prefectures which can communicate by telegraph, the average prices fall after the introduction of the telegraph. All right? What about potential endogeneity? One of the big potential endogeneity is what happens if during the period in which the telegram was being um, developed, there were other things, which of course there were, driving down price differences. So you get market integration, right? So what we do for that is we look at prefecture fixed effects and we lose a... We look for various other effects. First, we we claim that it's a good quasi-experiment because the telegraph was not designed to maximize um, commercial. The decision was, it's a little bit like the French railways. The French railways were initially built for purely military reasons and only secondarily for trade. And in the Chinese case, the decision as to where to locate the telegraphs were located for military reasons, even though that's obviously correlated with commercial activities. We have also controlled per pair fixed effects and month province pair fixed effects. We conduct an analysis of dy- dynamic effects with the telegraph, which I'll explain in, in a little bit. And we control for institutional and transportation factors. So we control for the treaty ports. There's a lot of papers in China which show that the early treaty ports then are still developing better today, because these are the areas in which Basically, treaties were signed with foreign powers to allow foreign powers to trade there or to set up an establishment, although in many cases, they were literally forced to accept the treaty ports as a a result of things like the Opium War. Nonetheless, those ports have done very much better. Um, And of course, Shanghai had a very prominent foreign area where foreign businesses and uh, richer people located. To this day, this area, which is called the Bund, is still a big tourist attraction and a very beautiful historical part of Shanghai today. Um, I believe my father worked for a time in the Bund and lost family property in the good areas of Shanghai. So I always heard stories about the Bund growing up in the 1960s from my father. All right, let's look at it. First, the clearest evidence that we have when we control for our prefectures the specific year of introduction of the telegraph, here's what we get. For all, that is on average, this was the difference of log price of time since telegraph construction. And as you can sort of see, prices are very high before the year of telegraph construction and they totally drop, not just once, but stably. It's a really discontinuous drop in mean grain prices before and after the telegraph construction. And you remember, the telegraph construction is happening at different months all over the country. And this is the, the result of the average effects of this across these areas with error bars showing the, the, the bounds at 95%. Okay? So I think this is fairly strong evidence that the telegraph is driving most of these effects that we are seeing in the first order regressions. If we also look at its effects on economic development, which is something we'd like to sort of see. Here we're looking at the role of, here are different dependent variables. So for example, what's the role of the telegraph in affecting population? How does it affect urbanization and city growth? How does it affect the number of modern firms? How does it affect the capital firms? And you'll see the number of years with telegraph until 1910, show us why do we end 1910, 1911? Because 11 is the nationalist revolution. That's the end of the imperial Chinese dynasty and we have a big structural change. We have an institutional change after that. That's the revolution of Sun Yat-sen in China. So we go on until 1910 and we find that the introduction of the telegraph raises popu- is correlated with higher population it, it's the number of years of the telegraph, by the way, is correlated with higher population, higher urbanization ratio, log of modern firms, and log of modern capital. This is less causal, but it's more, it, it's, it's suggestive. It's also um, 
the, this is controlling for log of population in 1880, right? So we control for areas that are already large in 1880. And obviously, log population in 1880 is going to be correlated with population in 1910. But population in 1880 is not a predictor of urbanization, modern firms, or modern capital in the period afterwards. So initial large population is not a significant predictor of sub subsequent urbanization. Sub that is to say, urbanization, modern firms, or modern capital in the last say 30 years of the imperial China, it's not a thing. Uh, areas, the same thing. Treaty ports have some relevance. It's interesting that treaty ports in 1910 are correlated with population, but they're not correlated with urbanization rates, but they're correlated with modern currents, as you would expect. That we also control for treaty ports. Treaty ports are one of the big reasons why you have foreign firms. So even controlling for treaty ports, the telegraph has an effect. We also control for the role of railroads, right? And railroads seem to contribute to urbanization and population, but they don't seem to contribute much to modern firms and modern firms' capital. So in these regressions, railroads seem to matter less for highly modern cities with advanced com companies. My guess is railroads are more about transporting goods and so they may have a bigger impact in terms of the value of goods in the provinces or things of that sort. I'm not sure, but it's quite striking to me that it has no impact on, no significant impact on modern firms or modern capital. Even though you have a large average effect, the error bars, it, it's, it's very variable. Um, and the provincial capital obviously is related to modern firms and modern capital, but it doesn't affect population or urbanization. Okay, let's go on. What about the Im impacts of the telegraph on social welfare? That is to sort of say, what happens to prices in areas which have a telegraph and an exceptional flood or floods? There are two kinds of floods. We've classified certain of the more unusual ones that is by historical standards is exceptional and some which are more typical of recent years. Are, limit, as, as are, are called limited floods in terms of which are smaller floods, right? And what we're doing is we see here that those areas hit by an exceptional flood with the telegraph have lower average grain prices after the flood than the places that, so there's a difference in prices. That is, so there's, there's obviously some kind of effect when often prices go up in the, if in, in, this, in, in the aftermath of a big flood, but places without the telegraph have a bigger shock than the shock to places with the telegraph. With the telegraph managed to get lower prices relative to the place. It doesn't say prices haven't gone up. It says that the flood, as you see down here, the floods, the droughts are all raising prices down here, the bottom yellow numbers. So the floods and the droughts are raising average prices, but then the interaction with the telegraph are lowering relative to places that don't have them, okay, um, et cetera. What about the regional heterogeneity? So what we do here is we look at what happens when both have the telegraph, a single one has the telegraph, and both have the telegraph and waterways, okay? So that one way to interpret this is first, let's look at the first row, both with telegraph. If, tele if both areas have the telegraph, we have a bigger drop in prices. That is to say, we, have, we, 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 we shrink the price differential, so we have closer to law one price in areas where both have a telegraph. Notice where only one has a telegraph, we have the same inconsistent results we have before. But this is the important thing. Let's look at this one in bold. Both have a telegraph and both have waterways. All right, what does it mean to have a positive effect? It means that areas which don't both 
have telegraphs and waterways have a bigger price decrease than areas where they already had waterways. So another way to put it is that having waterways, areas with waterways see a smaller effect of the telegraph on unifying prices than areas without waterways. So another way of sort of saying, if you have one form of communication already, then you're already getting some price integration and telegraphs, telegraphs are improving regional unification at the margin. But areas without waterways are getting a much bigger boost from having the telegraph, right? And similarly with this, you have a single waterway, this, and you also get, this effect is weaker, there's a lower positive, but it's also saying that places which don't have a waterway before both areas got the telegraph, right, are getting a bigger boost. Is that understood? So does that explain why we have a positive number? Uh, we have positive numbers here, what the meaning of these positive numbers here versus the negative numbers here. All right, I hope that's clear. And then if they're on the border of three provinces, they seem to have an interesting marginal effect as well. So if they're border of three provinces, there's a potential for various kinds of transactions costs, but border of three provinces means there's a weak effect. There's a weak effect of both having telegraphs, partly because my guess is that the border of three provinces has some effects, but you know, maybe there are other forms of communication among the three provinces. I'm not sure about that, but that's probably my interpretation of this. What about the role of merchants, right? Merchants who had the telegraph, notice, oh, I forgot to put this in yellow. I can do this right now, actually. Okay. Merchants who both had the telegraph in their prefecture, we have data on very prominent merchants. They get an improvement in their prices in those areas. Single with telegraph, you get a weak improvement, right? Um, both with telegraph and with guilds have a stronger improvement than with only a single telegraph, but a weaker improvement when both with the telegraph. It, it, that could be because guilds help to stabilize prices to begin with, and because, and because guilds may already communicate information. For example, one way to think about that is that it's well known. If, if I ask, you know, one of the standard questions I ask in my intermediate micro classes is that, imagine you have two situations, a country with a perfect monopoly on the sales of gasoline, and another country in which the, the sale of gasoline is perfectly competitive with very low transactions costs. Now there's a big shock that raises the price of oil worldwide. Which country is going to have a smaller increase in prices? Countries with a pure monopoly or countries with pure competition? Answer? Somebody want to answer that question? That's a real question. Country A is monopoly selling of gas. Country B is competitive selling of gas. There's a world shock that say increases oil prices by 50 or 60%. Which country shows a bigger increase in gasoline prices? The monopolistic country or the competitive country? Make it simple. There's a one euro increase in marginal cost of gasoline or $1 increase, which one shows a bigger increase? Monopoly or competition? Come on, all you grad students and professors, nobody can answer this question off the top of your head? Huh? Everybody's feeling shy, so. Everybody's feeling shy. How about the professors? Anybody want to answer it? Professor John, Monopoly. The monopoly will have the higher increase? No, yes. the monopoly will have the lower increase. It's counterintuitive. Because remember, the competition, Learner. the competition Learner. has to increase the price by the full marginal cost. That's, I assumed it's perfect competition. In contrast, 
the monopoly is already charging above the competitive price. Remember, it, has a, it faces a downward sloping marginal revenue and demand curve. Remember, competition faces a flat demand curve. A monopoly faces a downward sloping. Downward sloping means just draw it. Just draw your standard monopoly with like demand, marginal revenue, flat marginal cost, and you raise marginal cost. You will notice the monopoly will raise marginal cost by less than the increase in marginal, I mean, it will raise price less than the increase in marginal cost. Whereas perfect competition has to transfer the full amount. So if guilds are also helping maintain monopoly prices, what they're gonna do is limit price variance. One way to think about that is competition has higher prices on the average all the time, but they have lower variance. They don't decrease prices as much when marginal cost goes down. They don't increase prices as much when marginal cost goes up. So that's also a potential explanation for this cross particle with both telegraph and with guilds. This is why it's very important to remember your basic micro when you're doing empirical work because you need to think about all these effects when you're, in, you're, you're ex investigating um, these kinds of relationships. I'll leave out some of the others, but they're, they're also relevant. I don't wanna to waste too much time. We have like 12 minutes left and I want to get to the end. Um, if you look at other things, if you have Telegram and if you have officials, key officials in the area, then you get bigger positive effects. I mean, negative effects which means you get bigger price effects. That should not be surprising. Um, if you have recommended ministers above the median, you also have big effects. And uh, with genealogy books about relative prominence of certain kinds of officials, you, get a, a, you get also get an effect, right? So basically having a telegraph and having connected officials is correlated with, with more competitive improvements in price as well. All right. Uh, okay. We're just about done. So how shall we summarize the results? The introduction of the telegraph to both sending and receiving prefatures decreased the monthly price differences by nearly 20%. Moreover, the telegraph accelerated urbanization and industrialization and had a mitigating effect on rice prices when disaster occurred. The effect was larger for those, pres those prefectures accessible to waterways in the borders of three more provinces, indicating the telegraph was more effective in areas less suitable to tra traditional forms of communication, such as waterways. And the channels through which the telegraph promoted market integration were merchants' trade activities, local connections, human capital, social capital. Now, and of course, this contributes to the huge literature on how modern technology affects markets. So here's an interesting question. Purely from the self-interest of the Chinese mandarins, what would they say about this presentation? If you were a ruler of China, you were the group that had conquered China and ruled it for a few hundred years. What would you say about this presentation? Please put your answers in chat so we can see them all. Yes, let's look at the answers. Shall I close this now so I can see the chat? Or where's the chat? Let's see. No, no, you, you, Here we go, I see the chat now. Put me an answer. What's your answer? What would the Mandarin say about my presentation? Come on. Did they make the right decision to delay telegraphs or did they make the right decision to adopt the telegraph? I'm not saying this is causal. I'm just sort of saying, what might they say? Give me an argument for either. I don't care. Give me an argument why the telegraph is better. 
Give me an argument why the Telegraph is worse. Depending right. so on somebody the answered that, that If you want modernization, somebody wrote, Ilya Vaskin wrote, if I, it depends. If I wish to modernize, I support adopting the Telegraph. What about the reason for not supporting the Telegraph? To get high monopoly for yes, prices and, very good. and get more <laughs> money from monopoly well, maybe power. not more money because remember, just because the private merchants have a monopoly doesn't mean the government gets more money. Yeah. Uh, You're the government. But it's uh, still you bribe, I mean, you, you, how you derive your income. Right, but you get taxes. You will get higher taxes from everybody with higher growth. So maybe you'll get depends fewer on bribes. tax again. It depends on taxes because all right, okay, but but I think you're missing the most important thing. Again, you're you're focusing on the details and not thinking about the big thing. What happens in 1910? Revolution. So it's yes, and almost certainly, improved communication makes revolution possible. So. I'm not saying it's causal, but one could make the argument that modernization was actually bad for the old regime. It's not different from the arguments for Russia. Well, but it, it remember the, the paper of uh, Robinson and Nasimoglu who say mm -hmm. depending on the type of regime. So sometimes modernization may, might be bad. Yes, exactly. But I'm not talking about type. I'm telling you the type. It's the Chinese mandarins. So it's exactly the Robinson story. I'm not saying in general, I'm saying for the mandarins. Mm -hmm. So for the mandarins, they're probably unhappy. They would have preferred to be in charge for 100 years with China just as poor as it was in 1820. They would have preferred a China that could have been smaller and poorer, but that was maintained. All I'm sort of saying is that I'm not, I'm not saying this is a good thing, but I'm saying when you want to think about the role of technology, there are a lot of things going on. And because, because one of the things we haven't done yet, but one we may think about is issues like political economy. What are the long runs political economy issues? What are the interactions of political economy? Who are the winners and losers of this? Too often when economists just talk about these things, they look at it in a very narrow lens or in an idealistic lens. If you really want to do deep political economy research, you want to think about these interactions. One thing to look at is, does the, for example, does information change the composition of the leading ministers? Does it change the composition of leading merchants? Which families are, are growth? So for example, Shanghai is almost famous for its commerce, but Shanghai's role in modern China becomes extremely important thanks to two things the role of the foreigners there in the treaty ports. And I'm sure modern technology in, for example, in 1935, Shanghai was probably the most modern city in Asia. My guess is that in 1935, Shanghai and Manila were the two most modern cities in Asia because of the strong role of foreigners, trade networks, right? Both Shanghai and Manila were crucial to shipping trade all across the Pacific. Moreover, in a world in which most of the other countries were relatively backwards, with the exception of Tokyo, um, the role of Shanghai and Manila as ports became very important. Sh Shanghai was the center of US control and US shipping, as well as military power in Asia. Hong Kong was only just getting started. Hong Kong was not the Hong Kong we think of today. And in fact, part of the growth of Hong Kong is because of the decline of Shanghai and many rich Shanghainese moved. So for example, Shanghai's, I mean, Hong Kong's population has traditionally been Cantonese. But in fact, many of the elites in Hong Kong were from Shanghai. They were wealthy Shanghaiers who left China after 1949 and settled in Hong Kong. It's not a surprise, um, right? The, one of the most famous banks in the Far East is HSBC, Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. That's the, what the HS stands for. So all I'm sort of saying is that when you see a paper like this, you should immediately be thinking, not just 
Is the paper good? Is the paper clear? Can I understand the results? That's the basics. You need to do that with all papers. And in the questions, you can criticize and discuss my paper. But you should also think about how do I use this paper to think about the world, to think about new research projects? Does this give me ideas about research projects in other countries? Can we think about the role of communication? Or even the bigger question, why do some countries impede in new, in new, um, new technologies? What are the, it's just like many countries highly censor the internet. China from the beginning has censored the internet, right? To use the internet in China, you have to go through the Great Wall of China. Right? If you do, if you do searches on things like Tiananmen in China, you will get different results from doing searches on Tiananmen outside of China. So, and China obviously is losing something by controlling their internet, but they feel they're gaining something as well. TikTok is designed to be vulnerable. There are many back doors. Many people have talked about the fact that even though TikTok has a former Disney head as chair now, TikTok is still has still many holes in it that make it vulnerable to spying in and use of your data in ways that are not allowed in many of the American or the Western companies. So there's a lot of costs of doing some of these things. So all I'm sort of saying is that whenever you see a paper like this, it's not just about one thing. It is about one thing in terms of whether it gets published or not, is whether the journals like what you've done. So obviously that's your 90% of your work to make sure, because you know, this paper could still be rejected because somebody says, I don't like the fact that you didn't include the control for whether they were watching cartoons or whether, you know, whether their friends were, you know, whether we were moved from Russia or something like that. I have no idea. The referees always think about weird things to ask you to do. But the issue, but when you're thinking about this as scholarship, not just as an input into getting tenure or getting a better job or getting a raise, but think about scholarship. What deep questions can you ask? You want to look at this and see this in its broader context. That's why I've emphasized throughout my talk the background on China, the background of technology. Right? The telegraph was in its way as important as the internet. Think about the world that just has waterway communication and land communication. The telegraph becomes the first nearly universal technology that allows instantaneous communication. Right. In contrast, almost every other thing doesn't. The only thing you can get instantaneously, like if you can do, people used to do things like have smoke signals, or they would have met semaphore in Europe and China, where they would have these big towers on top of mountains with arms, that the arms could be moved to make letters or signals or words, and then somebody else in a nearby mountain could see that and then they would signal and signal to the next mountain etc that's a kind of visual telegraph but that's much more inconvenient it requires areas in which you can erect large towers that can be seen by other towers and they were much more limited in contrast the telegraph can be built pretty much everywhere okay it's now 12 o'clock i'll stop and answer your questions Thank you very much, John. So please, sir, colleagues, don't be shy to ask her questions and or probably give your comments. So please put I your questions in chat so everybody can see them or just raise your hand and ask questions. I have so, questions. Yes, yes who is Olga. This? That's Olga uh -huh. Vasilieva, right? Yes. Olga, what, what's your question? Hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I have few questions. Actually, first concerning indigeneity. Look, mm -hmm. uh, what, if you are talking about, I mean, just thinking, if you are talking about like uh, the end of uh, 19th century and the beginning of uh, 20th century, so mm -hmm. uh, it's a time of massive invasion of foreigners in China. Mm -hmm. so yes. Is it possible that something which, you know, that say, milit I don't know, but something which correlated with invasion, correlated with uh, distribution of telegram, uh, telegraph, and also with, you know, uh, say, pri uh, how, how, uh, how volatile prices were. Mm -hmm. 
Say for but I mean, the, the point is that we have nothing. We've done a lot of checks. We have nothing that gives us this. No, I mean, can you, uh, did you try to control for the areas which were occupied by foreigners? Yes, yeah, treaty, that's treaty ports. It's highly correlated with that. We've corrected. For yes, but ports. still, say you treaty ports. It's not Russian. Say Russia occupied uh, uh, northern part of Russia of China, and Russians were in Beijing in uh, 1901. I understand, but still, Treaty Ports is a, is a proxy for most of the invaders. Yes, and I, still. I, I, I don't see any net effect. Moreover, uh, remember, Beijing is not that important in the 19th century. Almost yeah, everything yeah, is but, southeast. South, yeah. Southeast, yeah. Yeah, my point is try first look at a uh, uh, zone of occupation of different countries okay. and zone at, so, at all, if there is some effect. Maybe something, you know, maybe you still see some heterogeneity. Yeah, it's possible. We can look at it for heterogeneity. I'll look at it. But it, it definitely doesn't work for prefecture to prefecture because this, the areas are so big that these are working within prefectures. So, I mean, I mean within, within, within occupied regions because there are multiple prefectures in one region. Yeah, anyway. but also say, when I look at uh, Northwest, I see this also uh, line which for me, it looks like the line which came from, you know, building, Russian building of uh, railroads. And yes, but look at this, look at this Northwest. We don't include this whole Northwest. But part. previous, oh, you, you just excluded, yes? You yes, we just excluded. It? And even okay. all the white, we just exclude. Okay, okay. So this is the Russian part, right? Near here. Yeah, so this, yeah, no, yeah, it's, yeah. it's all gone. It's just yeah, not there. I just, well, look at previous uh, pictures when we saw just uh, no, 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 no. gray, we're, we're, gray. Uh, no, no, but this is the but, one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, same. Okay. Se okay. Second point, maybe. I think you, uh, of course, your paper is uh, close to say Gradichenko stuff papers or something like this yes, about yes, yes. you know yes, prices, yes, yes. whatever. Yeah. Uh, you remember that they actually even were able to uh, to assess uh, distance. So not just coefficients of the, but say how much telegraph decreases distance between in miles. Uh, okay, so we, we could probably do that. We haven't done it. Yeah, but, but I mean, yes, yeah. and, and increases in, in, in opposite, yes? You, you understand. Yeah, so I'm not sure. How, I have to think about that because I'm not sure about those distance stories. Because, and um, you should because look often, it, it, often among prefectures, the role of distance is less important than the political connections and but, the waterways. But, it, but you understand that the base literature is saying about decreasing or increasing uh, trade distance. So if you trade uh, borders or uh, some kind of stuff. I understand, I understand. I'm not sure we'll find that very, but I can look at it. Because again, we're looking at the developed areas already. So anyway. Still say, you understand. I understand. Like, I understand. And we're doing prefecture to prefecture, right? So that's the point. Yes, but still you can assess how yeah, yeah. big but, a but, distance or smaller distance became. And if it's reasonable, you well, know, but I mean, one way to do that is very simple. You All you're doing is translating our price drop yeah. to what's the equivalent price drop in terms of miles. Yeah, exactly. But it's kind of good way to show that your yeah. results are reasonable. Yeah, yeah but yeah. I think my results are more, more reasonable. We, we can discuss this at another time, but I would claim my results are better comparison to look at the role of the waterways, which is more important than distance. Okay. And one more thing. And one more thing. Quickly, so we can get to others. Yeah, uh, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I just wonder, is, is it, I mean, you have a few dimensions, you have uh, time, and you have uh, pr uh, preferences. Uh, are you sure that you, I mean, Perfectures. are you sure that it uh, doesn't have spurious regression in terms of maybe it's not stationary? I mean, your variables. I haven't seen any test. Maybe I skipped something. We're doing not, we're not doing time series, right? But still, we're, you we're, have we're uh, panel data. Panel data, but still, you it might be non-stationary. Non-stationary. I'll have to think about that. I don't know why it matters that much, but I'll think about it. Uh, I think because of co-integration, it might be co-integrated or not co-integrated. But, but this is just like an on-off thing. This one, it doesn't matter whether it's stationary or not. This picture. 
I mean is, baseline regression, just baseline. I understand. But I mean, this picture of diff what we care about is on average. This is the main picture we care about. Does the telegraph reduce it or not? The others are just details. And some are not causal, but we're just trying to investigate. Really, this paper is one picture, this. The others are details. Okay? Thank you, Olga. A lot of good questions. Next one. We do have a question from Paula. Okay. Yeah, yes. Hi, John. Thank you very Hi, much Paul. for uh, this very nice presentation, I would say, as usual. <laughs> so, really, <laughs> I was you, very happy to attend. And, uh, uh, yes, this is exactly the, the paper. And um, as a comment, uh, just as a comment, uh, um, for me, it was very interesting, the part you presented on the impact of the, tele of, of the telegraph, uh, mm -hmm. in, which is uh, this innovation, relatively mm -hmm. to the presence of waterways. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can see this uh, as a sort of uh, um, uh, substitution effect or complementarity effect. Moreover, you can also see uh, some idea, you can also implement uh, uh, this uh, empirical part of thinking about some network effect, but I do not uh, know too much about uh, China to understand how you can uh, eventually uh, empirically uh, test for uh, some sort of uh, network effect. But my point, my comment is, uh, uh, since this telegraph is a public investment, uh, I would uh, stress, maybe you can think to stress more, uh, this result you have uh, in terms of policy implication. So uh, mm -hmm. at that time, it would be um, really relevant for, uh, uh, the, uh, for the government mm -hmm. to put the telegraph in the region in which there was no waterways or in the mm -hmm. province, I don't remember, prefectures. So the, yes local uh, institution in which you have uh, the um, if you in which you do not uh, uh, if you, in which you do not have uh, uh, waterways or other way to exchange information mm. just in terms of uh, the highest benefit given the cost to implement this uh, innovation maybe you can uh, emphasize uh, much more this kind of uh, policy implication because i think it is really very interesting also okay, connecting with this uh, Substitution, complementarity, and network uh, externalities. If you thank you. Okay, thank you. Although we are not, we're limited a bit because we have so much in the white space, which are not important economically, but which may be more important militarily, right? So yeah. we don't have Manchuria, we don't have the borders with Russia, etc. Yeah. So our data are primarily concentrated in the commercial regions. So our focus is on the directly commercial, but obviously things like the role of the waterway and complementarity are very important. And obviously the fact that you get a net benefit even with waterways does suggest that there's the net effect is complementarity. There may be a substitution effect, but there's also complementary and the complementary wipes out the substitution because the net effect is still, is still negative. Yeah, but what is really relevant is that uh, in this uh, research, you are able to uh, identify the, um, the, um, the, the, the level of benefit through this kind of uh, different sure. complementarity, substitutional, right, or whatever. Right, right. So that would be very interesting to be stressed, in my view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions? It's Students, as usual, know everything. <laughs> yes, Masha. Uh, I do have just one technical question yeah, about sure. Telegraph and how it works. Yeah. Uh, how public is the information that you send through Telegraph? Can you send like private message and be sure that there is this message going to be uh, really private? So if no, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. In the sense that, well, once they put the Telegraph, they don't. I mean, I, I'm not sure how they could do it. I don't think they had anything they claim to be private, but of course, the person receiving the telegraph will read it, and you can't do anything about gossip or something like this. So there is a huge information spread if you send something by telegraph, unlike some other types of information transmissions, right? It may be, yes. I'm not sure. All the okay. water, yeah, it may be. Uh -huh. there, may, there, okay. may be a, there may be a privacy risk. Uh-huh. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, you colleagues, any, any other questions or comments? I think that there is no questions or comments just because there is so many things to think of 
so people are just a little bit uh, Sorry, I have a was quick it? question. Uh -huh. um, well, thanks, John, for the interesting presentation. Um, this question is also somewhat related about distances, so maybe you will just discard it. Um, uh -huh. And um, I'm not sure if it's somehow covered in table five, but uh, my question is like related to like, um, is there is, if you can observe any, if, if, I mean, if it's feasible to observe uh, the effects of the telegraph, for example, in the cases that you have like two like cities this that one, are- This table? No, the previous, I mean, uh, the previous one. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I'm not sure if it's somehow included here, my question, but I'm wondering, like, uh, let's say if, if you have two cities that both have telegraphs, but mm -hmm. both depend, are in different prefectures, so technically each prefecture would have only one single telegraph, but since these both cities have a telegraph each, if the, if the price difference will be reduced between these two cities that depend, that belong to different uh, administrations, let's say. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question, Bernardo. So let's suppose that we have like two cities that are relatively close, but they depend on different prefectures. And um, so you have like a In telegraph. other words, if closeness compensates for not having a telegraph or something like that? Yeah, close, like uh, basically like closeness but uh, of cities, but like that do not depend to the same region or prefecture or province. Yeah, yeah, and what you're saying is that therefore the telegraph will not help us much because they can just run to the other side and share information. So that I'm trying to say that the, if you look at the information of the of the prefecture or the province, you would say oh, like there's only like a single telegraph, but uh, still like between these cities with telegraph, I I would expect that the the price will be reduced. Uh, I'm not sure if. Uh, I mean, I, I guess it's another way of uh, presenting if the distance feature is important or not uh, in, in the design. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's Olga's question in some ways, but uh, we'll, 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 we will have to look for that later. Yeah. But I, we thought it's better to simply look for those with and without data, uh, but, but we, with and without um, telegraph. Mm -hmm. And my last comment, so um, yeah, I understand the, the, the importance of the waterways. I don't know if there were like uh, any other measures to, uh, I don't know, any other ways to measure like uh, if like different cities were connected. I don't know if they had access to like good uh, roads or some sort of sure, I understand transport that. network. Uh, I understand that. So you want to correct for all other transportation networks? Or at least others that are in, uh, that were important uh, back then, but uh, I mean, I no, don't know much about Chinese history, so like I'm. No, I understand. I understand. Start. I understand. And we are not trying to say there aren't other means of communication, which might also have an effect, but we're trying to isolate the biggest one, which is waterways. Which is the waterways were in China the most efficient ways of communicating long distance, because it was the most reliable. Um, way of long distance communication, right? Either through letters or through individuals traveling to each other. Mm -hmm. The other alternative is walking, running, you know, riding a horse, that kind of thing. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah. And John, could you could you look in, in chat? There are a couple of questions from Ilya right, and Syria. Let me look at the chat, sorry. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of last ones. From whom? Let's see. I don't see it. Ilya. Oh, Ilya says, who built the telegraph? I think it's the government in jointly with some private companies, private foreign companies. It's like what we would call today a private public partnership, I guess, is the way of thinking about it. Because the Chinese mm -hmm. government did not have the capacity to do it by themselves, right? So they're authorizing it and they're making contracts with foreigners. And one more comment there. Yeah, where is it? I, I see this one by Hitendra. Uh-huh. 
It says grain market was more efficient after the but area of China is too big. Then telegraph coverage was restricted or not. I, I am not sure I understand the question at all. I mean, China is big, but in the, the area we're covering, you know, if you look at China as a whole, two thirds of their prefectures have telegrams. And so areas that are more farther separated than say in countries with zero telegrams, even if they're smaller, often had better transportation. I mean, better communication. One way to think about this is what happens even today. So I grew up in the Philippines and I can tell you that in the Philippines, there were islands that by, Amer by world standards would be very small if they were like a single country. But in the same island, there are four different, um, there are four different, how should I put it, language groups that are different. That is to say, their dialects are so different that people crossing the hills could not understand each other. And that, that happens like in places like India, the Philippines, Africa, because in areas which have very high standard transportation and communication costs, language can develop very independently. And then as soon as you have a telegraph or telephone system that dramatically affects things. So we see this effect today. When I did studies of price integration in Manila and the Philippines, what I found is distance was a very weak predictor of price integration because very often areas which are close in distance but have geographic barriers or political barriers of various sorts um, with respect to the way the market functioned, they are less integrated than, barriers that, than areas that are very far away but have good transportation communications and no impediments to transportation. I mean, no impediments to trade. So the, the size of China is important, but in, in my view, what it explains is why there is such a big effect for prefectures that suddenly got the telegraph versus those that did not. Mm -hmm. Let's see. What's uh, I think that we have for time for very last question from Kedar. Sure, so go ahead, Kedar. Let's have final one. Go ahead, Kedar. Yeah. So thank you, Professor Jan, Maria, and uh, Paula. Good to see you, both of you. And uh, thank you, Professor Jan, for wonderful presentation. I just have one question. In fact, uh, uh, could you please give me some uh, uh, suggestion for reducing the asymmetric information problem? Or uh, some uh, country's example where the asymmetric information problem is... is no, no, I, I can't do that in general because there's so many things that do it. Okay. And some asymmetric information is almost impossible to remove. Mm -hmm. Some is deliberate and some is a function of high transactions cost. So the rule of thumb is anything that lowers transactions cost should, not always, but 90, 95% of the time should have an effect in terms of lowering asymmetric information. So for example, not only have widely, have a lot of new data, but data that's widely available. Just think about the role of the newspaper historically. Think about how important the newspaper, imagine the New York and London stock markets. They were not very well integrated when it took a long distance to travel and forget information. You had to wait a ship. So the, the time it takes for a ship to arrive in the United States was the shortest distance for the US to find out about London's stock prices until the telegraph. Then you have instantaneous communication. And then of course you can improve the asymmetry because by simply publishing a newspaper with it. So people who could not afford to get telegrams from London could simply read the daily newspaper, right? Now we have the, we have the internet, which gives very live feeds from uh, the Dow, but there's some delays and then there are, there are services you can pay for that will give you instantaneous feeds from the markets for those for whom a difference of a few minutes is, is crucial. 